Oh, thanks, Steve. I was telling him, you always know when golf's coming because everyone gets rid of their coats and shorts start coming out, so I realize I'm overdressed now. Um, my name is Scott Robinson, and I'm obviously pleased to introduce Jeff Gilmore, who is not only our EMA counsel and the godfather of the antitrust policy, but he also chairs Ackerman's construction practice, a team that is dedicated to providing practical counsel on legal aspects of major construction initiatives and infrastructure projects around the world. Uh, Jeff has earned widespread praise, uh, has been recognized by Chambers USA, the Legal 500, uh, Best Lawyers in America for Construction Law, the Virginia Business Legal Elite in the Construction category. Clearly, Jeff is far more than just what we all know him as, as the antitrust guy. Uh, today, Jeff will provide insights into several of the more significant financial matters that are affected by the contract. Whether this is new information or a tutorial, Mr. Gilmore's vast experience will benefit even the most informed construction professional or legal advisor. With that, Jeff Gilmore. Good morning. Thank you very much. The room is fuller than I thought for the topic. So uh, Dave Dolnick uh, really kicked things off uh, talking about risk management and more specifically risk transference, dealing with insurance uh, and related products. Uh, I'm going to talk about financial issues, the legal aspects of financial issues. Just a little background, I obviously am that voice in the woods on the side of the room that reminds everybody of their antitrust compliance. And uh, so I'm just that guy but finally the coach put me in. And so uh, I don't know if I'm the water boy or if I'm Rudy, uh, but, but, but I'm here, this is my opportunity. So I'm gonna try not to stumble off the stage too badly and uh, keep everybody really riveted with uh, liens and payment bonds and all that great, exciting pre-golf sort of content. Um, but uh, in any event, uh, risk management is uh, obviously what contracting is all about. It's about how you manage risk, how you shift risk, how you transfer risk. Uh, but let's face it, the risk that uh, is among the most critical to everybody is the risk of getting paid, because if that doesn't happen, uh, we're all dead in the water. Uh, so that speaking, I, I'm, I know polls, uh, sometimes people raise their hands, sometimes people don't. Uh, how many construction lenders do we have in the room? Okay, not a single hand went up. I've got news. Every one of you are construction lenders in this business. The question is, what are your terms and, uh, and how, how, how badly are you going to get strung out by the ultimate customer? I know that sounds a little bit cynical, but the, uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, in, this, in this business, uh, we all know, uh, Dave talked about how things flow downhill, which includes risk, including credit risk. And the question is, what kind of credit risk are you taking on, whether you're a manufacturer, a supplier, a distributor, a prime contractor, a subcontractor, you name it. Everybody is dealing with that payment risk, and the ultimate owner or developer wants to put as much of that financing obligation on you, albeit short term, uh, but the idea is obviously to have favorable payment terms, uh, that allow them to manage their cash flow. And the question is whether you're going to be uh, managing that cash flow on your back or whether you're going to take steps to protect yourself. Now, uh, I think uh, we heard a lot about uh, underwriting in Dave Dolnick's presentation. And certainly underwriting is something that most of us think about in terms of uh, underwriting of insurance policies. Uh, but frankly, as lenders, which I'm going to characterize you all as today, uh, you got to think about your underwriting standards. And I will tell you, the most sophisticated construction lenders uh, all have rigorous underwriting arrangements. And frankly, they step in and they look at personal guarantees. They look at, uh, they look at getting uh, mortgage interests, uh, security interests. And they cover the landscape and get detailed Dun & Bradstreet, uh, uh, financial credit history, scores, you name it. And uh, not all of you have the luxury of doing that, but I will tell you that you have to go into any particular engagement with an underwriting mindset. And beyond that underwriting mindset, you have to be cognizant of where you're working and what the remedies are that you might have when all else fails. And obviously that's part of the underwriting risk assessment, knowing what tools you have in the toolbox to deal with uh, that payment risk. So with that, I'm going I'm to move forward. Um, uh, 
I just love that overhead sight of that road, but anyway. Uh, so what, uh, as I said, a lot of this involves understanding the remedies. So I'm gonna to try to talk about all of uh, these things. And a lot of this is pretty obvious. I'm guessing that you know, none of you would be in this room if you hadn't dealt with and managed these issues already. So again, part of this will be a review. Uh, part of this will be a tutorial. If anybody has any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. The legal advice is all free. It's worth what you pay for in this instance. But, uh, but if you have any particular questions, I may not be able to address the jurisdictional specific uh, aspects of what you're asking, but, but you know, we, can, we can have the conversation. So obviously contract terms is where all of this starts, understanding what those payment terms are. And uh, you know, some of this depends upon the economic climate that you're operating in. How much bargaining power do you have? You know, if you're, as we heard in um, one presentation Sarah was talking about, turning away, I think 80% of the uh, work, 70% of the work, uh, just because of the staffing challenges, you know, it's a seller's market. You, you, you have more leverage in uh, establishing payment terms. And you know, do you want to go out and hire a lawyer every time to go through and restructure and retool the horribly one-sided agreement that the person upstream sends you? Probably not, but you, you, you may have the ability to do that depending upon how much in demand your uh, goods and services are. And, uh, and secondly, you may also want to have a strategy where you have, as part of your proposal, a standard payment terms uh, and uh, with, with language suggesting that in the event of a conflict, your form governs, and if, uh, if they want you to sign up, then you know what, that's part of the deal. And that's, that's one way, if you have the, uh, uh, the financial uh, standing to, uh, you know, to, to compel the, your customer to sign that, it's a, it's a good approach. Obviously, mechanics liens, I'll talk about that in more detail as we go through the slides. Uh, statutory liens are similar, except instead of leaning the property, you're leaning the funds that are ultimately flowing from an owner to a GC. Many states have trust fund statutes, which uh, essentially establish that uh, the funds that are intended to flow down to lower tier participants are treated as a trust and therefore not the property of uh, the GC or, or whoever is uh, between you and the, the flow of that money. Um, payment bonds, performance bonds, we'll talk about that. That's another great product if it's available. Uh, and then, you know, if all else fails, I put on the bottom promissory, promissory estoppel, quantum merit. These are all these sort of quasi-contract theories. If somehow you didn't get it in writing or you, you, you did something that wasn't uh, properly documented in a change order, uh, all, else, uh, you know, all else fails under the terms of your contract. You may have one of those theories, but you're probably going to end up sending your lawyer's kids to college if you have to go uh, down that path. Uh, so it's not necessarily the, uh, the best uh, route, but there are options uh, aside from the, the formal ones that we'll talk about. Um, so the uh, obviously payment conditions, uh, you know, you, a lot of people are used to working, for example, with the AIA uh, family of documents. And you've got, in, in a lot of these family of documents, uh, fairly balanced terms that talk about a process and you know, thou shalt submit your payment application within 10 days and, and it looks like this and you've got you know, all the deliverables that you have to uh, produce. And, uh, and obviously understanding that and making sure your team uh, understands from a contract administration perspective how to adhere to that. And it's not one size fits all. Fees do vary from project to project. Uh, but as part of that underwriting process, you've got to understand and at least be prepared to conform your conduct to whatever that requires, or at a minimum, negotiate uh, terms that are more suitable to your uh, particular circumstances. Uh, another topic I want to talk about is rights related to uh, uh, payment default. What does that mean? Uh, you know, in the, uh, in the wild, wild west, that might involve uh, certain weapons, uh, but, uh, but that's not what I'm talking about here. Uh, there's always the idea of, you know what, they don't pay, we're not going to uh, deliver, we're going to stop work. But the fact of the matter is the, uh, the boilerplate, the general conditions in a lot of contract suggest that you have to continue performing even if there is a dispute over payment. You have to continue performing even though there is a dispute concerning the time and money associated with the change order. And the question is whether you're going to accept that and be bound to continue or whether you're going to have terms that more reasonably provide that in the event the, uh, the upstream party is in default of their payment obligations, 
you have the right to suspend work, and they have the obligation to pay uh, for your remobilization. Uh, or if, if, that's, if that condition persists, you've got the right to terminate and walk away from the agreement. And again, in a balanced contract, there should be those terms. You should understand that uh, you, you have those exits or those, uh, those tools in the toolbox should you need them. Uh, another thing to think about in the context of contracting, uh, a lot of uh, people in this room are further down, uh, lower, lower tiers, uh, not necessarily in control of the prime contract between the owner and GC, but I would bet that uh, with the vast majority of you, you have some sort of flow down provisions that say that, uh, that in your subcontract that says that the terms of the uh, prime contract are incorporated by reference into the subcontract. What does that mean? Well, obviously you have to know what that means and in many instances, some GCs won't even share that document with you. Or you can come into the trailer and look at it you know, while heavily supervised, but they're not gonna give you an opportunity to look at it and assess it. And the fact of the matter is, if you're signing on to that sort of flow down arrangement without knowing what those terms are, you are signing a blank check because those terms may well uh, govern your relationship. Now in some states, um, for example, New York, uh, you have laws that, uh, or, 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 or court decisions that suggest that unless there is specific attention brought to terms that are incorporated by reference, a general incorporation by reference is not going to bring every term into the contract, just those terms that are relevant to that particular uh, trade contractor's scope of work. Nevertheless, you've got to understand, given where you are, uh, you know, how uh, courts are going to treat those flow down arrangements. Uh, another issue which I know you've heard lots about uh, over the years dealing with contract administration or a lot of these remedies we're going to talk about, you know, notice, notice, notice. Um, when notice isn't given, people spend a lot of money on lawyers coming up with creative arguments about how there's constructive notice and they really should have known and it was mentioned in these meeting minutes. And the fact of the matter is sound underwriting, uh, sound contract administration means that you know what those terms are. You've got a checklist that you have developed at the outset to understand uh, what steps you need to do to uh, comply with the relevant notice requirements that are, are critical to your uh, payment ultimately. And if not, you know, you'll figure it out when you have to, but having that built into your system and assigned to the responsible people within, on your team to, to know that, it, it uh, can avoid a lot of arguments about waiver and failure to uh, comply with conditions preceding. And uh, frankly, when it comes to liens and um, payment bonds, uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, you miss those notice uh, requirements by one day, you know, you are nine times out of 10 gone, done, that remedy is waived. And so it, it obviously is uh, important. Another thing that um, uh, you know, most people pay attention to, sometimes it is a, a, uh, by virtue of a flow down clause, what law governs? Um, many of you uh, provide your goods and services in multiple markets. Uh, some focus on one market, you know that market well. Uh, but there are some uh, owners and general contractors who have found uh, those states that have uh, most, the most favorable laws and the most favorable um, um, uh, holdings that uh, protect their interests. And so you may find that uh, your contract is governed by a far different set of laws than you uh, thought you were used to. Likewise, you know, the venue for disputes, uh, that's, that's important. Uh, typically it will be a venue where the project is, but not always. And, uh, and that's critical. And, and I will tell you that uh, in some states you have laws which uh, essentially override attempts to make a, uh, uh, you know, a project in Virginia litigated in, in Kansas or whatever, but, uh, but that's not universal. So you, you need to pay attention to that. And if you're willing to take that risk, fine, but do it knowingly. So uh, the other distinguishing characteristic we need to talk about is public versus private. First of all, how many people here do work on public projects? So I'm seeing some, and I know that, uh, I know that, uh, uh, Ema is very uh, proud to have people from NAFAC and the Army Corps of Engineers who were involved recently. And, uh, and so, I, and I know from experience that uh, uh, in the public uh, marketplace, uh, uh, EFS is a product that's used uh, on a whole array of facilities. And so obviously that brings with it uh, a unique um, set of uh, uh, remedies, if you will. 
Uh, some of you may have heard of the Miller Act, but if you're on a federal project that's valued at over $100,000, uh, the prime contractor has to furnish a 100% payment and performance bond. That's great news for all of you underwriting your credit risk on a particular project. Um, some people think that if they send that surety a notice, the check is going to be in the mail in three days. That's not quite the case. That just means you have a solvent defendant most of the time. But the fact of the matter is it does provide, um, in many uh, circumstances, a very uh, uh, reliable remedy. Uh, not, that, not that sureties roll over, but it does, it does help. Uh, there is, uh, of course, one thing you have to understand, if you're a lower tier, this obviously doesn't apply to uh, prime contractors, you don't have a direct action against the government. Um, you probably will see, as part of the flow down arrangement, uh, language that suggests that if there is a dispute or a, a request for a change or a claim related to some directive from the government owner, uh, that you have an obligation to participate in a pass-through claim which essentially allows the uh, prime contractor to bundle that up, present it as a hopefully a certified claim, and then go through the uh, disputes process mandated under the uh, uh, Contract Disputes Act and the federal acquisition regulations. And in that context, uh, ultimately disputes either go to the uh, U.S. Court of Federal Claims or one of the uh, boards of contract appeals. And you have to understand that you may be obligated, based upon those terms, to uh, um, uh, exhaust that uh, avenue of relief before you're able to pursue any action against the prime contractor. But the Miller Act, uh, to the extent you have a payment uh, problem with your upstream um, customer, uh, is a, uh, a useful way of, of uh, uh, finding your relief against a, uh, a surety. And of course, the sureties are vetted, and uh, there are approved sureties by the Department of the Treasury, and, and so generally they are uh, qualified and uh, in a position to uh, pay claims. They just don't do it, they don't roll over. Uh, in the state and local arena, again, it depends on the state you work uh, in, but virtually every state has something called a Little Miller Act, uh, obviously very similar to the federal. Uh, some of the deadlines, some of the notice requirements are different. Uh, the, the, the coverage of uh, different tiers can be different. For example, under the, uh, under the federal Miller Act, um, you know, a prime, excuse me, a sub to a prime, a supplier to a prime, um, you know, all of them are potentially covered, but a supplier to a supplier uh, on to, and then who falls under a general contractor is outside the coverage under the Miller Act. And you have to understand that risk going in. And, you know, that scenario certainly exists in this industry with distributors, um, suppliers, uh, trade contractors, and so on. Uh, and of course, I don't want to forget, not everything, uh, uh, even if you are a sub on a public project, uh, you've got uh, uh, options uh, that involve whatever is mandated as a disputes process between you and the prime contractor, and whether that's arbitration or litigation. Again, those are all things that should be spelled out and you need to look at as part of your underwriting process. Uh, and, of course, if you are strictly in the private sector, this is not a publicly funded project at all, uh, that is a, uh, again, it's going to be driven by what your contract says, again, in terms of uh, arbitration, no arbitration, and what the uh, local uh, laws uh, allow you to do. And so that's obviously going to be different from, um, from place to place. So risk assessment, as I said, you're all construction lenders. Uh, so you know, first and foremost, is there adequate financing? I mean, you're not, you, you know, you're, you build things, you, you manufacture products. Uh, you know, you're not, you don't see yourself as the ones taking the risk of whether there's adequate financing. But again, some due diligence is important here uh, because let's face it, there are lots and lots of single purpose entities who have been carefully structured uh, to limit the exposure of upstream parent and affiliated companies. And you may be, uh, dealing with an entity that is a one-trick pony formed just for this project and their only asset is the contract they have to deliver this particular project. And so you, you need to understand that that figures into your credit risk. Uh, as I said, looking at whether there are adequate contract remedies, I've talked about all of these. Uh, and, um, and, and then looking at the bottom of the list, you know, sometimes you have third-party guarantees to look to. That's uh, not typical, but uh, I do see it. 
Uh, sometimes you have situations where a project becomes stressed, a general contractor becomes stressed, or a performing, performance bond surety steps in to take over for a prime contractor, and you might have an opportunity for arrangement to negotiate a joint check arrangement. So you don't have to worry about the vagaries of whether that money is going to pass through to you. It's issued as a joint check payable to you and the prime contractor. And again, that can be a helpful way to get past some of those bumps in the road. Uh, so I, this may be too small to read throughout the room. Uh, this is a, a cut and paste from uh, an AIA A201 document. And this is a concept that, um, that they introduced some years ago. Uh, and the bottom line is, it provides a vehicle, typically though this is between the prime and the owner, uh, to get assurances about adequate financial arrangements, uh, the ability to demand proof of those financial arrangements, and then as you can see in the, the second half, uh, to the extent that you're uh, ordered or directed to perform change work, similar rights, uh, and again, this, this sort of clause comes in all circumstances, but frankly, if you're in an environment where um, there is uncertainty, uh, uh, this, this is incredibly useful. Do you see this in the typical subcontract? Of course not. Most primes are not going to put this in the subcontract. It might be incorporated by reference. It might be part of the standard terms and conditions that you want to consider when presenting your uh, proposal. Uh, but it is something that allows you, frankly, to, to do some due diligence, and so I would, I would consider it. Um, so, you know, more things that uh, influence credit risk and influence your underwriting decision. Uh, and I think this was advertised in the brochure for the water boy to speak. Uh, pay if paid and pay when paid. Interesting stuff. A lot of you probably already know that, but, you know, traditionally uh, the contracts were pay when paid, you know, we have an obligation to pay you within seven days of when we're paid. And, um, and many courts have uh, construed that sort of simple approach as uh, allowing a reasonable amount of time uh, for the uh, prime to pay the sub. Uh, but ultimately, whether the prime gets paid or not, the, stub, the sub uh, still gets paid. They just may have to, have to wait a little bit, which is never a good thing. Um, Pay if paid, though, is a whole different animal. And pay if paid is, uh, and it has to be very well laid out in terms of the contract language, you don't get paid until we get paid, or you only get paid if we get paid. And it's got to have language that clearly says that payment from the upstream um, owner, if you will, uh, is a condition precedent. Will that be enforceable? And, and courts have applied a lot of scrutiny in looking at these arrangements and, um, oh, did I go back there? No, okay. Um, and, uh, and, and limited their enforceability. I'm gonna talk about that on a, on a later slide. Um, retainage, another topic I said I would talk about. I'm gonna, I've got a slide that goes into that in more detail. Um, I, I, does anybody not have retainage terms imposed on them? Is that, uh, it, it, it's, okay. So everybody's used to dealing with that. Conditions precedent, lien waivers. I, I want to touch briefly before I go on to the other slides about lien waivers. Um, a lot of um, subcontract agreements will have as forms, as exhibits, uh, lien waiver forms for partial payments, for final payment. They'll have conditional, unconditional uh, lien waiver forms. But the contract mandates that those forms be used. How many people actually look at those? And the fact of the matter is some of those are straightforward. Um, they clearly say that uh, you only waive uh, your rights to the extent of this payment. That's a fair and balanced approach. Some are much more aggressive and you've got to read carefully what you're signing. It may be you know, titled as a partial lien waiver, but if you read it, you're waiving every right to every lien and every claim for anything that predates the uh, submission of this particular lien waiver form. So they're not as innocent as the titles and they're not an administrative task. They have to be looked at carefully. And, uh, and again, it may, you may or may not have the leverage to push back on that because oftentimes, you know, just reality check here, those are mandated by lenders and ultimately the lenders are responding to the demands of their title insurance carriers. And so I don't want to send anybody on a fool's errand, but you may or may not have leverage in negotiating that. But the fact of the matter is you may be waiving much more than you think with some of the progress payment lien waivers. Um, 
insolvency. I just put that on there as a reminder. Uh, if you've done all this due diligence and assessed your credit risk, hopefully, I, hopefully you've minimized that. But if that does happen, that's where you've really got to look closely at your, your, your lien remedies, your payment bond remedies, uh, and also look very carefully to what happens in the bankruptcy and make sure you're submitting proofs of claim in a timely fashion. Uh, as far as retainage, as I said, I'd get into this in more detail. Retainage, as best I can tell, is a concept that's pretty unique to the construction industry. I'm sure there are other examples, but one of the things, if you do have any bargaining leverage, you know, is it, is it necessary and is it reasonable? Um, you know, one would argue that if a uh, contract has a 100% performance bond, why do you need retainage to secure the performance of a, a given participant in that project? Uh, also, when you look at broadly written retainage um, uh, terms, uh, why do you need 10% you know, held on general conditions, 10% held on uh, insurance, 10% on uh, you know, some, uh, you know, some other specialty product that is being delivered? And I would suggest that uh, one size doesn't fit all. And again, you may or may not have the ability to influence that, but uh, I think there are, are uh, grounds for arguing that uh, retainage uh, should be reduced. And uh, the other issue, of course, is the uh, prime and owner may have one level of uh, retainage, but there may be a whole different approach to the downstream people. And the question is whether that is uh, reasonable. Now, if you uh, canvass the 50 states, you'd find a whole array of laws that deal with this, and um, many that deal with public sector projects, a fewer number deal with private sector projects. Uh, in Virginia, for example, the maximum retainage on a public project is 5%, um, but you don't have any limit uh, in, uh, when you're dealing with private work. Um, and then at the bottom of this slide, uh, the kind of language that you see in the AIA documents, for example, uh, indicates that the subcontractor retainage will be reduced to the same extent the primes is uh, reduced. And of course, you often see a situation where maybe the retainage is 10%, Halfway through, it's dropped to 5% and maybe dropped further at a, at a later stage of completion. Well, that should all flow downhill. And, um, and, and it's, uh, you know, similar, uh, you know, what if you're the, I know this doesn't apply to people in this room, but what if you're the excavation uh, contractor who, who dug the hole for the uh, foundation at the beginning of the job? I mean, your work is done, accepted. Uh, the project has come up out of the hole. Why are they holding retainage on you until the end of the job? So, you know, it, it, the, the rationale is not necessarily there for retainage in all instances. Uh, so I, I wanted to uh, give you another example, only because I come from the uh, D.C. area, uh, the Maryland Real Property Code. And the reason I think this is interesting is because it's an example of a statute uh, where I think trade associations have been active in trying to influence uh, legislation there uh, that uh, provides some regulation in the private uh, sector. And uh, again, though, you can see there's a lot of compromise here. It only applies with contracts of greater than $250,000, maximum of 5%. And of course, it assumes that there's a 100% payment performance bond in place. And, um, and then, you know, so you've, you've, you've got those sort of uh, safeguards for uh, those who would want to hold the retainage. And also, it has pretty broadly written language about exceptions which would allow withholding of a greater amount if there are performance or, or quality issues that have been documented. Uh, the, um, I guess I got these slides out of uh, sequence. That happens. I'm just the water boy, so it happens. But the, uh, the pay when paid, I think we talked about that. Uh, the pay if paid. I did want to mention that in some law, in some states, either by uh, legislation or by uh, 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 court holdings, uh, the, the uh, pay if paid is completely outlawed. Uh, but that certainly isn't universal, and, and many of you may be aware of more restrictions. But but uh, obviously, that all is going to depend on where you uh, operate. Um, so I want to talk about mechanics lien rights. And uh, I, I, little history lesson here. This is an educational forum that's part of uh, EMA's mission. Uh, so I think you'll be happy to know that uh, the first uh, mechanics lien laws in this country were introduced in the Maryland General Assembly in 1791, uh, really uh, with the uh, foresight of Thomas Jefferson, believe it or not. And it was really done to uh, 
uh, promote construction of the capital city, which was then part of Maryland, uh, Washington, D.C. Um, this is not political commentary, just geographic fact. It was a swamp, uh, and, uh, and there were concerns about whether people in that town would pay their bills. And so Thomas Jefferson thought a, uh, a mechanics lien remedy, which he borrowed from uh, European uh, systems uh, that were uh, known at that time, uh, this approach, and uh, so Maryland really led the way. Now what's interesting is, in 1976, uh, interestingly, in the year of the bicentennial, uh, Maryland held that their mechanics lien law was unconstitutional. Uh, kind of an amazing turn of events. Now they have since adopted another mechanics lien law, but I will tell you it is one of the most cumbersome, expensive, inefficient lien remedies uh, of any that I've dealt with anyway. You can't, in a lot of states you fill out the form, you get the right information about who owns the property, how much you're leaning, you know, that, that sort of stuff, and you go in and you record it, and, and you've got some leverage from that point on. In Maryland, you've got to file a file suit first, and, and a preliminary lien will be issued if you can show probable cause that you're entitled to a lien. So, unfortunately, it involves way too much legal time and is, uh, is pretty cumbersome. But, you know, if that's the circumstance you're in, it's, uh, it is an available remedy. I've already talked about um, the strict timelines. Again, they're gonna be different. You know, in Virginia, you gotta file uh, 90 days from the last day of the month in which you last did work. Generally, that's not warranty work, that's not punch list work. You gotta look at you know, when you last delivered something or when you last performed core contract work, and maybe you can get creative if you miss that and characterize warranty work as contract work. But uh, again, to be safe, you've gotta look at a uh, more conservative date, and you gotta know that in your jurisdiction. Another, um, option is, you know, in some states they talk about a stop payment notice, which in, F, in essence is part of a lien remedy, but it does just that. It tells the owner to, hey, stop payment. I'm not getting paid. You've got to hold the money uh, and, and, until I can perfect my right to, uh, to uh, recover that money. And so that's obviously a little different twist. Um, the one thing I will tell you, even though it can be cumbersome and can be expensive, I'm sure you all have horror stories, um, lenders pay attention. You file a lien and most of your customers will say, you know, please, please don't do it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that hits the books right away. Right away. The title insur uh, insurance company is aware of it. Uh, it is probably a default on the part of the general contractor to have a lien filed against the project. They're going to either deal with you or they're going to bond it off. Now the only good thing about bonding it off is it's back to having that solvent defendant. And so it, uh, it can be useful. Again, I know it's expensive, I know it's cumbersome, and it doesn't build good relationships with customers, but it's one of the tools you've got to consider using from time to time. Um, so I mentioned statutory lien funds. Uh, this is a listing of some of the states that um, um, uh, statutory lien on construction funds that have it. I couldn't tell you much about them uh, because I, I'm not intimately familiar, but obviously in different states you've got these options that are outside of what is traditionally considered a mechanics lien. Uh, construction trust statutes. Um, again, I alluded to this in the opening. Uh, Maryland is a, another example of a state that has this. New York has this. Essentially, is it, the idea is to protect lower tier uh, parties from the misappropriation of the money. Uh, you know, if uh, owner pays prime, Prime diverts that to make the payment on the, the yacht or to deal with other financial stress it might be uh, incurring. Um, you know, this is a law that says that that party does not own the money, it's held in trust, and essentially as a trustee of those funds, they have certain uh, legal obligations. And if they don't, the people who misappropriate that money face personal exposure. There is under the Maryland statute, although it's not often enforced, the ability to recover um, legal fees. It can also be a useful mechanism in the bankruptcy con uh, context. Uh, if the prime gets a lot of money and then goes bankrupt, in most situations, well, that's, you know, that's part of the uh, money that the, uh, the prime contractor has as part of it, its bankrupt estate. Um, under this law, uh, you have a, a legal um, arrangement that says that no, that isn't owned by the prime, it's trust money, and therefore is not, you may have to go to bankruptcy court to get it released, uh, but it's not going to be something that is swept into the bankruptcy estate. It is going to flow. And so we've seen that as a useful 
uh, option in states that have uh, trust fund statutes. And again, these uh, statutes have been handled in different ways around the country. So obviously you have to know the jurisdiction you do business in. So uh, prompt payment statutes, another topic that uh, uh, we want to look at. Uh, it's obviously an idea that has flowed um, from the, uh, the federal sector. You've got federal prompt payment statutes, which really were designed to make the government pay its bills on time. Um, but again, it says that the government has to pay by the date specified in the contract, whatever that might be, or 30 days from receipt of a proper invoice. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of battles about what a proper invoice is. But it, it is a way to push and it is a way to, uh, to uh, obtain um, interest on uh, delayed payments. And it is something that contracting officers, in my experience, pay attention to. Um, this, there is also in that uh, law uh, obligations on the prime to timely pay the subcontractors within seven days, and if they don't, they have to pay interest. And, uh, the, but the one thing that I, I think you have to be mindful of here, uh, you don't file a suit for a violation of a prompt payment statute. It doesn't provide a private right of action. It creates these obligations, uh, but it, it does not uh, independently create a cause of action, so, which is, is, is kind of odd. Uh, but obviously, it is, uh, it is uh, if, if you violate it, uh, or if a prime violates it, they face certain penalties. Um, uh, but, uh, but it doesn't necessarily give you, you're going to have to look at other remedies, uh, whether it's you know, suing for a breach of contract for a payment default or what have you. It doesn't create an independent cause of action. Uh, as I said, uh, this has been copied in, uh, throughout the United States. I, uh, by, by my last check, 49 states in Puerto Rico. Uh, I don't know if this has changed since I last gathered this information, but the lone holdout, New Hampshire, live free or die, and, uh, and no, no prompt payment, I guess. But um, in any event, uh, that, that could have changed since I last looked at the statutes, but for years that was the situation. Um, and, uh, and some states have prompt payment requirements that not only govern public projects, but also private contracts. Not many, uh, probably about two thirds of them. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, again, it's going to be, they all follow similar templates in terms of model legislation, uh, but it's different. Uh, Pennsylvania has a particularly robust arrangement. Anybody here from Pennsylvania, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on it, but uh, at least on paper, it looks like uh, it has teeth. And, um, you know, some of, the, uh, some of the aspects of that Pennsylvania statute, um, you know, a lot of this is just common sense. Uh, but um, but if, a, if a prime is going to withhold money, they've got to give notice to the sub within 14 days of why they're withholding that money. And if they don't, they waive their right to withhold that money, which is pretty powerful if they're not timely communicating. And the, again, last I checked, the penalty rate uh, for improper withholding uh, of funds that are governed by the Pennsylvania Prompt Payment Act is 1% per month, better than Wall Street this week. So that's a, that's, that could be a good recovery. Um, I've already talked a little bit about the, uh, uh, the Federal Miller Act and probably got ahead of myself on those other slides. Uh, but again, that's, if you're on a federal project, that's a remedy you need to look at. Uh, the, uh, the state uh, Little Miller Act Again, it's not identical to the federal act, so you gotta know where you're doing business, and I'm not obviously gonna deal with all that in this uh, short segment. Uh, but there are also, on private projects, a lot of lenders, um, it's not just you, uh, and trying to manage their risk of keeping a lien-free property require that uh, prime contractors you know, provide performance bonds. It's, uh, it's very helpful. They ultimately have to pay the premium on that. It's a pass-through, um, but it's, uh, it is part of their underwriting often. Um, but again, you must be aware, and you may not even have a copy of that payment bond. And frankly, a lot of people don't like to share those bonds because primes don't want you suing their surety because they then have to indemnify that surety because surety bonds are not insurance. Uh, ultimately, that whoever um, um, uh, arranges for that bond, uh, the, the, the general contractor typically, they ultimately have to indemnify um, the uh, surety against any losses or claims expense they incur. Uh, so on a private project, again, they're often similar to the Miller Act, um, but again, creative lawyering. Uh, there can be a lot of uh, altered terms. Those bonds may not be as robust as you're used to, may have different deadlines. And like anything else, if you don't follow the recipe in the cookbook, 
you may be uh, out to lunch. So it's, uh, if, if, if your project uh, is accompanied by uh, payment bonds, uh, really that's something that uh, you need to know about. And frankly, why, during peacetime, at the front end of the project, when everybody's shaking hands, uh, sometimes it's easier to get that information. Uh, and, uh, and, and if not, uh, on a public project, you can write the contracting officer, you can send a Freedom of Information Act, and they'll turn it over. On a private project, um, oftentimes if a, if a prime or the party that arranged for the bond refuses to furnish it, you can reach out to uh, the owner and uh, get their cooperation. Uh, so, the recovery playback. Let's see, okay, I may finish early here unless there are a lot of really good questions. Uh, so I, I talked about this theme of underwriting, uh, credit risks, uh, you know, doing your own due diligence, understanding the terms. Again, I know this is, this is basic blocking and tackling that you're all, you've all thought about, uh, but uh, you, know, you do have to have a process and a system in place with somebody who has that responsibility to, uh, to assess the payment risk project by project. And of course, once you have repeat customers and so on, it's not so difficult because you know what you're dealing with. Uh, time in and time out. And uh, again, as I said, uh, whether it's public or private, uh, or uh, depending upon the kinds of uh, suspension and termination provisions uh, and so on, uh, you may have different, uh, uh, different remedies available that you need to be cognizant of. And, uh, and to the extent there are deadlines, there are notice requirements, uh, you really you need to have a checklist, uh, and I have clients who have developed a standard checklist as part of what I'm, I don't think they call it underwriting, it's what I'm calling it. And uh, you know, they, they go through uh, you know, these different uh, issues and understand uh, you know, what, what are my options on this project. And uh, again, a lot of this information is much easier to obtain in peacetime before there's been a payment default. Um, you know, I, I occasionally will have a client who comes in and it's the 89th day of that 90-day window, and I want to file a lien tomorrow. And I'm like, okay, great, who's the owner? Uh, well, and there's sometimes uncertainty about that because people may not be so clear on the single-purpose entity that the prime contractor contracted with. Uh, they, they may not know who the affiliated entity is who owns the real estate that you're going to lien. And so knowing that uh, can prevent a real scramble when, uh, when the clock is ticking. Um, similarly, in states like Virginia, you have a lien agent uh, arrangement where in certain circumstances you, uh, there's a designated lien agent and that's the party that you give uh, notice to. But in other jurisdictions, you know, you've really got to carefully, like in Maryland, you've got to figure out, okay, which, which entity are we going to sue here? Uh, who is ultimately the, the, the formal owner, not just the kind of generic name that everybody's using, uh, but uh, that, uh, that information uh, you know, takes time to put together. Another thing, since a mechanics lien is a remedy that encumbers real estate, uh, you have to have a reasonably accurate property description. And when most people you know, bid on a set of plans and specifications, they've got a plan view, you can see the property, uh, you know, maybe you have an address for the property, um, but in many instances, that kind of information is not sufficient to adequately describe the property. And I'm not saying that in each instance you've got to have a full-blown meets and bounds um, you know, surveyor's description, but, uh, but you need to pay attention to uh, the kind of property description that, uh, that accurately describes. Because if you lean the wrong property, or in some states if you lean too much property, more than what is being improved in connection with a particular project, your whole lien can be uh, thrown out. And again, on day 89 or whatever the clock says, uh, really tough to get that stuff together. Um, and timely notice, but I, uh, I said that several times. So, um, okay, there's the end slide. That tells me that I'm ahead of schedule. Golf is not in, uh, is off the critical path now. I don't think I'm gonna disrupt the, uh, the schedule. Any, any questions or any, uh, anything I can address? Okay, thank you.